Hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. Hello, my friends. It's Jill Osborne from the IT Network. It is Sunday, the 19th. And I just can't believe how quickly time is passing here. I'm just adjusting cameras a little bit. Yeah. So I'm here to do yet another live IC support group meeting. Um, this is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And so it gives us an opportunity to maybe talk a little bit about some Thanksgiving survival skills. Um, but I have some news to share too. So my purpose in doing these meetings is to make you more knowledgeable, more informed, more educated. I want you to be able to walk into the doctor's office with your head held high. No shame, no blame. You have done nothing wrong. Absolutely none of this is your fault. You have an injury. You are a pelvic pain patient. And my job is to educate you, inform you, maybe open up some new doors uh, to treatment. Hello, Gay. Nice to see you. We are simulcasting. If I'm looking straight, I'm looking at Facebook. If I'm looking over to the left, I'm looking at YouTube. Hello, Angel on YouTube. Now, I will say I have been up since about four in the morning. I'm getting a little, a wee bit tired. <laughs> I've been filming all morning trying to get some videos done. And I woke up worrying about my phone bill. I have three landlines and they've just tripled the price of it a couple months ago. So my old phone bill was like 120, now it's almost $400 and I'm very annoyed. So I woke up annoyed at four in the morning. Hopefully I will come up with a solution tomorrow. I do not want to spend $4,000 a year on phones. That's utterly ridiculous. Um, so, 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 so I, so I'm a wee bit scattered because I had a real funky night. Um, but I've got a couple things that I want to share with you. Um, first of all, so normally when I do these support group meetings, we do a little 30 minute educational spiel. Hello, Carolyn. Um, and, um, and then I will take your questions. I'm happy to take questions. That's probably not going to be a long support group meeting because, um, my brain is saying it wants to sleep. <laughs> Anyway, look what's here. Yes, finally. Our fall magazine, the Fall IC Optimist. You know, uh, um, the IC Network, even, we facilitate the largest support group uh, in the world. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of members. Um, but a lot of people ask, well, where do you do your best work? This is where we do our best work in this magazine. And the articles on this magazine, some of them are on our website right now, but the, the really big ones are not. And they won't be on our website for at least six months, most likely. Hello, Margie. Margie said, so excited since I talked to you a couple of weeks ago. And you were right. Pelvic floor problems been diagnosed and getting set up with a physical therapist. Yes, baby. Woo. Excellent. I love it. I love it. Um, so, uh, and I got an interesting story that I want to share about that, but, and I don't know what's going on here with Facebook. Carolyn Gay, is everything okay with the sound? Let me know if there are any problems. Uh, here, hold on a sec. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, what's so interesting is, is that this is when I do these meetings, they've really become kind of a, um, a lifeline for patients who can't come to real meetings. And I love that over the following week or two, hundreds of patients listen in. And so to those of you who are listening remotely after the fact, I send you my love and my support and you are not alone. And if you ever want some help, you just want to talk to somebody, please call me. I would be more than happy to talk with you. This is what I do all the time. Okay, so let's get to this magazine. So um, this has been something that I have been wanting to write about for a couple of years now. You're gonna, you'll notice that there's a child on the cover. And the reason there's a child on the cover is because um, 
we are for the very first time talking about how a childhood adverse event can lead to uh, icy and widespread pain in some but not all patients. Emphasis on some but not all. Remember, we phenotype now. Not We're not all the same. So some people have Hunter's lesions, some people have estrogen atrophy, some people have pelvic floor, and some people <gasps> Wow. Wow. Rosalind Carter passed away. That just flashed across my computer. You know, Jimmy Carter's wife. Gosh darn it, what a year. Oh. I've had an emo couple of days, too. I've had a very emo couple of days thinking about my folks. Okay. Deep breath in. God, we love our moms, don't we? Okay. I did not expect that. I mean, usually my claim to fame is earthquakes in the middle of meetings. <laughs> You try doing a live support group meeting when an earthquake hits? Woo, that's fun. Okay, so to Rosalind Carter and the Carter family and Jimmy Carter, we send our love. Good people. Good, good people. Okay, let's get back to this. Uh, subtypes, subtypes, subtypes. So remember, we're not all the same. Some people have under lesions. Some people have estrogen atrophy. Some people have pelvic floor. And some people have an injury to their central nervous system and have widespread pain, IC or an IBS, inner vulvodynia, or a TMJ, inner fibromyalgia, whatever, right? And so the question is, that haunted me when I was younger is, why me? Why did this happen to me? Why did I not get a normal life? Why was I, from my teenage years, struggling with urinary symptoms, pelvic pain. Oh, Donna. Hey, hey, girl. Big giant hug. Ooh, that's a hard one, too. Um, vulvodynia, IBS. By the time I was, you know, in my, in my 20s, it was kind of a miracle I got through grad school because I had such bad IBS. Then that bladder pain hit when I was in my early 30s. Why? Well, now we know why. Injury to the central nervous system, and that usually occurs in childhood. Though it can also occur in adulthood. So what research we learned a couple of years ago showed that 80% of the children who eventually developed widespread pain suffered a major physical trauma. And the other 20% had a history of abuse or bullying. And an example that I hear all the time is somebody who grew up with a violent alcoholic parent where that child, whenever that parent started drinking, went into fight or flight. And it wasn't just once in a blue moon, it was every freaking day. And that habituates the brain into a constant state of fight or flight. And there's a legacy to that. Unfortunately, what that does is that leaves muscles tight, that sensitizes nerves and creates the foundation for widespread pain. So we talk about this. I found an absolutely outstanding article that I that I was allowed to reprint from the Center for here, hold on. A nonprofit here in, in the Bay Area, the Center for Youth Wellness. And so it um, it talks about how that young child's brain is very is in the process of growing at amazing rates. Ner thousands of nerves are developing every, every day, basically, throughout their childhood. And what happens when that, when that child faces a trauma? And there is very good news at the end because we, no, I mean, there's two pieces of good news. And I think number one, we know how to turn this fight or flight off. It takes really good practice with mind body medicine. Um, and I think it also, um, acknowledges that for those of us who were uh, who were the victims of trauma, I came from a very loving family, but I had a very difficult childhood because we had a young man that I grew up near who was very violent and he hurt me. 
many times. He tried. And, and that, that is what the created the foundation for me, undoubtedly. Uh, I have a great editorial. So here, I'll just, I'll just give you a little tour. Table of contents, YouTube, I know it's backwards for you. <laughs> we always have a meditation page or an affirmation page. That's our affirmation page. It says, sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. God knows we all have to do that. Um, this great article from the center. Our bodies are not meant to be in a state of constant stress. Uh, a review of fantastic class that was taught on IC earlier this year. At, uh, re review the research on UTI vaccines, which is a uh, Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Let me tell you, if there's one thing that's developed in the last couple of years that has the potential of helping millions of women, it is a UTI vaccine. This is so exciting. And it's been used in 26 countries now, and it's growing in use throughout North America. Hopefully, we'll get it soon here in the U.S. I go through the new research studies. Again, physical therapy found to be more effective than bladder treatments. Mm -hmm. um, this is fascinating. You know, there are only two other animals to get quote unquote I see, cats and monkeys. And in cats, it can be fatal. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Kayleen. Hi, Danielle. Oh, that's wonderful, Danielle. So in cats, um, th this quote-unquote interstitial cystitis, or they might call it idiopathic cystitis, um, leaves that cat urinating constantly and straining to urinate, and they're obviously in pain. And Dr. Tony Buffington at, the, at uh, Ohio State University he was a big IC researcher. He was a veterinarian who specialized in this in cats. Um, anyway, um, you know, again, everybody was looking for the smoking gun. Is there some sort of bacteria? Of course, that was not found. Certainly wasn't found in cats. What one of the things that he ultimately found in cats is that it appeared to be a long-term stress response. And right before he retired, what they figured out for cats is that for a cat with severe urinary IC symptoms where they'd ruled out stones and things like that. Uh, Renee, hold that thought. I'll be right with you, hon. Hello, Sandy. When they put them into a quiet, safe environment for six weeks, their symptoms went away. But if a stranger walked into the room, the stress of that stranger visit amped up their symptoms. So that was cool. But anyway, somebody somewhere figured, decided to try a single low dose radiation treatment on a, on a cat bladder and very, very low dose, not harmful. And stunningly, it, it's worked on every single cat they've done it on. Every single cat. I don't ask me method, mechanism of action. I have no freaking clue, but it's fascinating. Also in this, I go over the new clinical trial testing a new pain treatment for IC. You can find that right on the front page of the IC network, icnetwork.org. If you're in pain and you would like to try a new way of relieving that pain, you can sign up for this clinical trial. I added all the research centers across the country to our listing. So it's across the country, it's everywhere, and they are looking for participants. And it's a simple foam that's inserted rectally. So, and think about a BNO suppository for patients who have had very severe pain in the ER. They will often give you a BNO suppository, which is inserted into the rectum. Very, very effective strong and effective. Well, this isn't as strong, but it ha it might be quite effective for re reducing bladder pain. That's the, that's the theory and the early research points to that. So you can participate in that. 
if you struggle with energy, like you, you just like I could use right now, <laughs> to be quite honest, uh, energy boosters without caffeine. Um, and Stacy wrote a fantastic article on that. We go through foods um, and we go through other foods and habits and things you can do, like getting out in the sun. Um, if you struggle with seasonal affective disorder and you find that you get you find yourself getting a little bit a wee bit depressed during the winter, uh, you're not alone. Very common. And we have a great article on that and things that you can work on. Uh, hobby ideas, because we got to keep that brain functioning during these cold winter months to come. Uh, for those of us north of the equator, and the more you use your brain, the uh, that it, it's a it's a great distraction and it can help reduce pain. You got to keep your brain busy doing other stuff. That's why good pain clinics always have puzzles and things like that to do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're an IC Network member. This is right available right on your member page. I just went up there a couple days ago. And if you would like to read this, you can come on over to the IC Network and you can become a member for $25 a year. What a deal. Or you can just buy an individual copy. This is really one of our main fundraising tools for these meetings. So please think about this. I am drinking right now hot, very dilute, hot apple cider with Martinelli's Mulling Spices. So good. All right. Um, let me go here to a question, then we're going to talk about Thanksgiving. Renee says, I've been diagnosed with lichen sclerosis. So lichen sclerosis is a neuroinflammatory disorder that affects the skin of the vulva. The word lichen is misleading because that kind of implies plant material. It's not plant material. It is severe inflammation that leaves the tissue turning very pale, very, very pale. It's like the blood supply like slowly disappears. Uh, I have a lot of experience with lichen sclerosis because my elderly mother had lichen sclerosis. And I was with her at every OBGYN visit with standing with the doctor at the end of the table, looking at her vulva. <laughs> That's what you do when you're caregiving an elderly woman. Get ready. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the, the common treatment is going to be clobetasol, a strong steroid. Um, uh, Renee, you want to make sure your, your skin is as healthy as possible. So if you're showing estrogen atrophy or dryness, the doctor would normally prescribe also a topical estrogen cream to improve the health of that skin. You want to make sure you're not irritating that skin with any sort of toxic chemicals. So be careful with laundry detergent, fabric softener, mini pads, douches, anything at all like that. And also I will say that my mother's vulvodynia was absolutely the worst when she was exposed to a lot of oxalates, like from berries or chocolate. And so uh, she removed oxalates and that really helped her. Oxalates are crystals that are associated with kidney stone formula. But for some people, those crystals, as they come out of your urine and cross your vulva, can be just very irritating to super, super sensitive skin down there. So you could Google low oxalate foods. Now, you guys, I want to talk about Turkey Day. I have a lot of thoughts about Turkey Day. Um, here, hold on one sec. And I've got, we've got a lot of blogs that we're pushing right now. I've got, I just added a new section to the front page of the IC network with holiday self-help tips, uh, creating an IC friendly Thanksgiving, low key traditions to start on Thanksgiving. We've got other managing family stress Has an IC flare kept you home for the holidays, et cetera. So, um, I, to those of you who are newly diagnosed and you're facing your first holiday season together, do not hide. You are entitled to celebrate with your family. You are part of the family. I see pelvic pain 
does not change that. You deserve their love. You deserve their kindness. You deserve their support. The challenge with the holidays, the first challenge with the holidays is actually traveling. I can remember my first couple of years and I was reading, you know, it's so interesting over the week, over the last week, I was actually playing some instrumental holiday music and I was going through a lot of my old blogs and um, it was always, do I do it or do I not do it? Do I drive 20 miles to my sister's house in agony or do I stay home? I mean, that was the consistent question in my brain for at least a decade. Longer, no, longer, maybe even 15 years. When sitting in a car is very, very painful. Taking a drive to grandma's house that's going to be a 10-hour drive or a 15-hour drive is going to be rough. The bouncing of the car, the bounce, 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 bounce on the freeway can trigger your pelvic floor. It can make your muscles much tighter. And it's quite common for, for pelvic pain patients and IC patients to flare on long car rides. So, and I, and I have to tell you, my mother, God bless her, I felt hurt so strongly this morning. It was crazy. Um... Thank you, mom. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking to her quite a bit these days. Um, was a master at guilt. <laughs> you know, you know, you did it, mom. She, you know, she didn't want me to stay home. She didn't want me to be alone on a holiday. And even though I was like crying in pain, she's like, oh, honey, come on, get dressed. We're going to go. Mom, it hurt. Come on, honey. You can do it. I need you with me. And, and I got to tell you, she guilted me into some epic road trips where I was driving and I was dying on the inside. It was so painful. And after a couple of those holidays, it was like, I'm done. And I, it finally came that one holiday when I just knew that morning that I was going to be in too much pain to do it. If I got, if, if I made it to the other end, I'd be a, a blubbering lunatic crying my eyes out and or on pain meds. And I knew that it would not be healthy for me to sit in a car for a long period of time. And so, you know, we woke up in the morning and I just kind of said, okay, you guys, I just want you to know I'm staying home today. And she's like, and she did it for about two hours. She was like, all right, we really want you here. We don't want you to be alone. Come on. You've got to come with us. you got to come with us. I need you with me. Dad needs you. You have to see your sister. And for the first time, I resisted it. I was probably 35. <laughs> it took that long. She was that good. And um, I just very firmly put my foot down and just said, not today. There will be other Thanksgiving. Not today. You, I would love it if you could bring me some food home. That'd be fantastic. But I need to stay home with a heating pad. And I'm just going to relax at home. And as difficult as that was for her to leave me, for my, my brother, for everybody to leave Jill behind. And I will tell you, as I said last weekend, I bawled my eyes out for about 30 minutes before I finally calmed myself down and said, all right, go get your heating pad. Let's watch a movie. So I want you to give yourself permission to stay home if you need to stay home. It's okay. You get to come first. You don't have to sacrifice your pain to please other people. You just don't. And, and better yet, one of the best coping things you can do is just invite people to your house. Say, guys, I love Thanksgiving. Oh, my goodness. I love Thanksgiving so much. I just can't sit in the car for a long period of time. Would you all love to come here? Potluck, bring your favorite food. That's a win all the way. And better yet, you don't have to leave early. You can stay and play games. 
that was I, I love playing games on the holidays. And for the last 20 years, I always had to leave early to take my parents. And I miss that. So bring Thanksgiving to your home if you can. But again, no shame, no blame. If you just can't do it, you can't do it. The second thing we want to think about with the Thanksgiving is just food. And thankfully, the traditional Thanksgiving foods here in the United States are very IC friendly. Turkey stuffing, potatoes. Just don't put a lot of spices and stuff in your potatoes and stuff like that. Um, most of the Thanksgiving Day food, all the way to the pumpkin pie and even the apple pie, should be perfectly IC friendly. I would be very careful of tomato based foods. If your family has, if you come from an Italian family and you do pasta, eat a little tiny bit and for goodness sake, bring some. Bring some pre-leaf. Remember, pre-leaf is the most popular supplement that has been used in the IC world for the last 30 years. Two caplets of pre-leaf will reduce 95% of the acid in a, in a cup of coffee and all sorts of other stuff like that. So pre-leaf is great to have on hand for things like the holidays. Um, now we got to talk about the the jerks of the holidays, there's always somebody. You, let's say you get yourself ready to go. You're, you're good. I can go do it. And the, the dreaded Uncle Fred is there. And Fred irritates everybody. And Fred is challenging. And Fred looks at you with what you think is discussed. It might not be discussed, but there's always somebody who's like, really? You're still, what's wrong with you, Jill? You haven't fixed that yet? And Gay says, pre-leaf works yet. Great, good, I'm glad. You know, and, and this is where it would be very smart for you to bring things like the IC Optimist Magazine, our book IC 101. And then for anybody who wants to challenge you, just hand up the book and say, you know what? There's a lot I could tell you right now, but it's the holidays and I really don't want to go into it. But here's a really good book that I would love for you to read because I can promise you there are several people in your lives who might have this that could use your help and support. So, so please avail yourself of this fabulous book. I think you'll find it really helpful. Hello, Boria. Hello, Sanguan. Did I say hi, Sandy? Hi, let's see. Thank one. I just did the test, hypersensitivity test with hair. You tested positive for rye, brown rice, barley, and milk protein. We just started to eat without everything on it on the list. So in, in three months, maybe. So what? So I'm not familiar with that that exact that exact test that you've had. Um, there's something called a food sensitivity test that will help you identify foods that can be irritating. Um, I, I don't know the type of tests that you had. Um, I have doubts about some of the tests that are out there, but you got nothing to lose. If you think it might've identified something which is irritating you, go for it. You know, you can certainly stop rice, brown rice and rye and barley for several weeks and see if it makes your symptoms better, go for it. You got nothing to lose, go for it. Uh, Angel says, I still have incontinence and they wanna use my skin to make a sling, okay? So uh, incontinence can sometimes, it can happen when your muscles get very, very weak and sometimes they begin to prolapse and that's where sometimes a doctor will want to do a sling procedure to uh, tack everything back up into place. better That's better than a um, mesh, definitely. Hi, Peggy. All right, so hold on, let's see here. Let me come here to Facebook here. Carolyn said, just had my cystoscopy with hydro and biopsy this past Friday. How long will I have the vaginal discomfort? Well, 
The cystoscopy is, is really about the bladder discomfort. If you're having vaginal discomfort, that's kind of interesting. Generally, you should, the, most of the discomfort should go away within a week to 10 days. That would be my guess. Um, Carolyn, did they send you home with a catheter? Do you have a lot of blood in your urine? Kayleen said, I can't believe that my urogynecologist won't treat my clitoral adhesion. Ugh. And now I hate Thanksgiving because I had my favorite person's funeral the next day, two years ago. Mm, that's so hard. That's very hard, Kayleen. I guess you have what, what, Kayleen, I want you to think about it a little bit differently. Um, because I'm doing this with my parents. Um, ask yourself, how would they want you to live? And how would they want you to be on this holiday? Because they're, they don't want you to be sad. And if you believe in spirit, they're with you anyway. And, and so um, the holidays are daunting without loved ones. Um, on my approach to it is I'm doing exactly what I know my mother would want me to do. She would want me to decorate. She would want me to play Christmas music. She would want me to go celebrate with family. She does not want me at home crying on Christmas Day. I might cry a little bit, but I, I fully intend to be out there because I know that our family and friends want us to feel joy. Kaylee says, I do have an A&W &A can in the fridge right now. I want to sneak it in. Ah, <laughs> I like that. Gay says, pre-leaf works good. Carolyn says, no. Ann says, does Claritin help with frequency and mast cell activation? It could. It could. Sorry, guys. I've been filming for hours, and now all my makeup's coming off, and my hair's getting all weird. I started filming at 8 this morning, nonstop, trying to get videos done. Um, 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 let me just see if there was anything else that I missed talking about Thanksgiving. We had some good pearls. Okay, so um, surviving a holiday like Thanksgiving is all about pacing yourself, communicating clearly with your family, and of course, avoiding those things that we know can trigger flares. When it comes to traveling, we encourage you to keep your car rides short, as short as possible, or better yet, bring your holidays to your home. This is the time of year when it's perfectly okay to ask for help from family members and friends, particularly when it comes to cooking and cleanup. And why, why is there just one family member who rudely doesn't believe the IC is real? We suggest that you bring our fact sheets, our book, our magazines, or even watch, put them down and let them watch one of these support group meetings. Um, and then when it comes up, calmly look that person in the face and say, three to eight million women in the USA suffer from this pelvic pain condition and one to four million men. Here are some reading materials that will help you understand what I'm struggling with. And then change the topic. Don't be defensive. Don't be hurt. Remember, these individuals are just extremely naive or uninformed. It says far more about them than you if they bring it up in a hurtful way. I encourage you to calmly and firmly stand up for yourself. All right, now hold on one sec. We have a ton of IC friendly recipes on our website. All right, let's talk about this for a moment. Fifteen ideas. Let's see. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I think we've got so much here. We've got six different blogs, and they're so good. Okay, holiday survival guide. Every year, I see patients ask us what they can do to make their holidays more comfortable and happy. And if you're a newly diagnosed patient, this may be your first. Several questions come to mind, such as eating, traveling, and explaining IC to family. Who better to share their tips on surviving the holidays than our own members? So here are 10 great holiday survival strategies. Number one, perfection is not an option. 
If you expect to have a perfect holiday, perfect children, perfect gifts, and perfect health, and perfect friends, you will be in for a major disappointment. Life isn't perfect. We should try to meet an impossible standard, especially during the holidays. Remember that our most precious memories are usually the spontaneous moments of laughter when somebody sings off key, the smell of fresh baked cookies, decorating a tree, sitting in front of a fire, or maybe a great snow fight. Be spontaneous and enjoy the small pleasures of the day. This does remind me of the time my grandmother Betty made weevil soup. <laughs> she was making homemade soup and the noodles were filled with weevils. And my cousin, my cousin, you know, she served it up and my cousin looked down and she saw them and she put it up on a spoon and she went, Grandma, why are there worms in the soupy? <laughs> Believe me, we remember we remember those moments more than remember anything else. So enjoy the funny moments that can happen. Number two, give yourself permission to gently say no. We love our families, but during the holidays, our expectations can be quite different from our ability to fulfill them. Um, uh, let's see. I already shared that. I finally gave myself permission to stay home. It greatly helped. I love my family in the holidays. But after a few painful lessons, I learned to listen to my body and respect its limits. There will be more holidays. You don't have to push yourself to get through this one. And you know what? Honestly, I take all the emotion out of this. Hello from South Ireland. Hi there, hon. Um, finally, for me, what really helped is, is I just said to anybody who asked, are you going to Thanksgiving? I just said, listen, I won't know until that morning. I'm taking all the emotion out of it. I'm just going to wake up that morning and I'm going to rate my, get my pain on a scale of one to 10. If my pain is over a five, I'm not going. If it's under a five, I will be there to try to get rid of the guilting, you know. <laughs> Number three, surviving holiday parties. You receive the invitation and are dying to go, but wonder if you'll be able to eat or drink anything. If it's a dinner invitation, talk with your hostess ahead of time and explain that you greatly appreciate the invitation. But you have some diet limitations. You guys, hold on. I'll get to your questions. Um, uh, that you greatly appreciate the invitation, but have some diet limitations. Ask her about the menu. And if necessary, ask, ask if you can bring some food that you can substitute for your plate. A wise strategy is to eat an icy friendly meal before you go so that you won't be that hungry if you're unable to eat the food. Number four, bring the party to your house. We already talked about that. Number five, don't carry the holidays on your shoulders. We know how easy it is to carry all the responsibility. Gosh forbid you have IC or any other major illness or injury at this time when everyone expects so much, especially from us. Sometimes you just can't do it all. And think about it. The holidays are supposed to be about sharing and caring. This is the time. Uh, for you to ask for help if you need it. From cleaning the house to wrapping packages, make a schedule earlier and let everyone know that they need to carry their fair share of the load. Even young children can put their dishes in the dishwasher and straighten up their bathroom. Number six, selecting a precious tradition. This is one of my favorites. Every family member may have a very different way of celebrating the holidays. For some, it might be attending a service or a matinee movie on Christmas Day. For others, it might be caroling through the neighborhood or spending the day making cookies. Still others might want to help the needy. Ask each member of your family what tradition they would like to keep this year, then try to fulfill one special moment for each person and be willing to let go of old traditions that just aren't as meaningful. Number seven, find peace in nature. Yes, your life feels chaotic right now. Between work, kids, doctor's appointments, friends, and more, it's easy to feel as if your life is running you rather than you running your life. The best way is to stop off the runaway train of life. The best way to stop off the runaway train of life is to get outside and enjoy the serenity of nature and wild things. Whether it's raking up leaves, walking on a local park, ice skating, or just putting up your outdoor Christmas lights, being out of the house can greatly lift your spirits and that feeling of being trapped. Okay, number eight, let your children create some holiday magic. Not feeling well enough to put holiday lights or go get a Christmas tree? Many families let their kids do the bulk of the decorating. Buy a few craft magazines at your local supermarket, let the kids huddle over them, then create a new magical theme every year. Number nine, seek support for holiday blues. It's normal for many people to become depressed or develop a serious case of the blahs during the holiday and winter months. This is especially true for families who are struggling with illness or have lost a loved one. 
Oh, dear God. Um, to beat the blues, break your isolation by getting out of your house at least once a day. If you're not feeling up to getting outside, call at least one family member or friend and watch for signs of stress, such as headaches, restlessness, or sudden anger. And if it gets too much and you're feeling seriously depressed or having suicidal thoughts, please ask for help from a professional or call your suicide hotline. Those professionals can and will help. And last but not least, number 10, give yourself as a gift. The best gift that you can give your family and yourself is you. You are irreplaceable. You have to take care of yourself before you can start taking care of anybody else. So take frequent breaks to regain your energy. Pace yourself and eat well. Indulge in the holiday spirit when you can. And for those days when you're not your best, take a step back, rest and relax. May you have a wonderful and joyful holiday season. Uh, there's a lot more articles and blogs like that over on the IT Network website. I'm going through more. I want to have more. Okay. We've got questions. Let me go through these questions. Let me get a drink here real quick. Peggy said, I have my first guy neurology tomorrow. I did eight weeks of physical therapy for pelvic floor dysfunction. It helped with my stream, which is better, and getting up at night less, but the pain and pressure is still there. Couldn't continue with physical therapy because I injured my lower spine. It's better now. I'm going for an MRI. I have severe osteoporosis in my spine and have to go on bone building injections. I've been in a bad flare for six months now. Hopefully the cystoscope will tell me what is going on. I need some inspiration, I guess. Okay, so Peggy, number one, bravo. You made the appointment. You're going to the appointment. I want you to walk in with your head up high. You have done nothing wrong. No shame, no blame. It's that simple. You're a good woman. I want you to walk in confident, informed, and ready to talk turkey literally, about what the heck is going on with your pelvis. So, you know, ultimately in the end, there are three things we've got to figure out, three fundamental things. Is my pain coming from my muscles? Is my pain coming from my bladder? Or is my pain coming from my nervous system? Those are the fundamentals. But there are also some things that we want to make sure they rule out. Like, do you have a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder? Is there endometriosis on your bladder? Do you have, uh, in your case, because you've got severe osteoporosis, are we seeing some nerve compression down in L4, L5, which could be affecting your bladder? So um, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. It is absolutely fantastic that you've done your physical therapy. Keep it up because it's working. And it's, it's good. You know, I don't like guessing. I like facts, hon. And I, I think it's very, very important that it, you let somebody look in your bladder. I also would want to know about your skin health. Where are you with respect to estrogen atrophy? Where are you with respect to the quality and health of your skin down there? And it's not just going to be one thing causing all of this. There are multiple things in all likelihood that are contributing to your pain. Pressure, pressure is the challenging symptom. Gosh, you know, I was working, I was working with a patient. Oh gosh, maybe maybe like two weeks ago, who had um, a prolapse, and it was a a mild prolapse, but it was a substantial prolapse, and I think that her pressure was coming from uh, the prolapse with her bladder falling out of position and was was being stressed in, in a lot of different ways. So I would want to know, are there any signs of a prolapse, anything else like that? So girl, listen, you're an anatomical mystery to be solved. 
you're paying them for their expertise. I wouldn't walk in and say, I have IC. I wouldn't do that. I would walk in and say, I have pelvic pain. I am a pelvic pain patient. I have pressure. I'm trying to figure out where that pressure is coming from. I have been doing physical therapy. It has helped a wee bit. But I would like you to help me understand what else in my body could be triggering this pressure. Is it estrogen atrophy? Is there any chance that I've got something funky going on with my bladder, et cetera? Hello, Tamara from Belgium. And I truly, truly hope, you know, I have uh, quite a few friends and clients in Europe and with the war in Ukraine, their stress level is really off the charts. There's just so much fear about, you know, Russia getting involved and doing wacky stuff. I mean, getting involved and expanding it into other countries or being reckless and all that sort of stuff. So I truly hope that you're not living with that level of stress, but I have a feeling most people are. Um, guys, I also have to say that um, we are happy, we are running into so many roadblocks now shipping to Europe and Israel, uh, like literally packages sent before the, before the war there are just in limbo. Um, and so I'm really having a hard time shipping anything internationally towards Europe. What I thought I would do is I thought I would build a separate website for for ICUK with a shopping list of stuff that you could that that would match what we have in the IC network store like supplements to try to give you something near. But I want to try to do it on the Amazon UK website the Amazon Europe website and the Amazon Israel website uh, because, you know, it's, it's getting so difficult for us to, to, to ship stuff. It's ridiculous. Um, the best thing anybody could do who is in Europe or the UK is make a friend with somebody online who's in the United States or Canada and have them place the order for you. You can send them the money. You can't place the order because I've got the country shut down in our shop. So have, this is a great business idea for somebody here in the United States. Make a friend in one of your online support groups and say, Hey, can you order this for me? I can ship it to them, then they can ship it to you as a gift. I can't ship it to you right now. It's infuriating. And it's, you know, it's affecting, it's affecting us greatly. I mean, I want to be able to help. Um, also, for anybody from Europe, please email me, icnetwork at mac.com. If you want any E, you know, any email documents or anything like that, just pop me an email and I'll email them back to you. You don't have to pay for them. I just want to try to get you guys the support you need and deserve. And it's just, just so many roadblocks right now. It's kind of driving me batty. Um, Peggy said on twice a week estrogen cream, which helped with a mild bladder prolapse. Good. Hi, Boria, honey. How are you doing? How are you doing? Um, so I want to I want to share. I I'm, I filmed a video on this, but I want to talk about it anyway with you guys. So I had a patient late last week who called who was fascinating. So she had had really severe urinary symptoms for a couple of years. And her frequency was off the charts, like up every half hour all night long. And yet her urine cultures were negative. They'd never been positive. And when they looked in her bladder, she had a perfectly healthy bladder, perfectly healthy bladder. When she had her pelvic floor assessment, 
her muscles were very, very tight, very, very tight. So she called me and because her doctor had suggested physical therapy and she's like, Jill, this has to be an infection. There's no way. I'm peeing all the time. How can this not be an infection? I want antibiotics. She was refusing everything. I want antibiotics. I bet again, her cultures were consistently negative. And we've all been it. We've all been this way. We've all thought we had infection. And for the great majority of us, the cultures are negative. But it was a thing for her. She was dare I say, obsessing about it, thinking that she had this rare and difficult and terrible infection that nobody could find, despite the fact that there was nothing physically wrong with her bladder. She had a baby bladder like I have. And so I finally said, listen, prove it. Do a next generation DNA urine test. That's how you prove it. You, so next generation DNA urine tests are not cultures. The problem with cultures is that they're self-limiting. They will only grow out the bacteria that eat the food they give in the culture meeting, which means that they're going to miss 90 to 95% of the bacteria that could be in your bladder. So having negative cultures is common. And yet a next generation DNA urine test often finds pathogenic bacteria in those samples. Next generation DNA urine testing is saving lives around the world for all sorts of different diseases. And, and, and we have lots of research study to back it up that negative urine culture, positive next generation DNA urine test. I was just going through all the research. Hi, Sue. Um, and so I, again, what I said to her is, all right, you are clinging to this so so strongly. I double dog dare you to prove it. Have a next generation test. You can order. I have a website on it called Bladder Health, bladderhealth.org. And I said, now here's the scoop. If that test comes back positive, you got all the ammunition you need. If that says you've got enterococcus, staphylococcus, whatever, probably, uh, I mean, there's so many different potential pathogens. If that test becomes back positive, that's your evidence. And the advantage of a next generation test is that it gives treatment recommendations and it identifies drug resistant genes and it tests for fungus. So you can take the results of that test. Well, your doctor will already have the results and say, okay, doc, I know the culture said nothing, but the next gen found E. coli at 80%. I think I would like to treat that because hello, I'm symptomatic. And if that next generation test comes back negative, I told her, okay, that's it. You're done. If the next generation test finds nothing, you have to assume there's nothing there. And we have to instead look at those very, very, very tight muscles that you have. So in this case where she was just literally obsessing over it's a UTI, it's a UTI, it's a UTI, it has to be a UTI. And even though I say, listen, the bladder only knows one language, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. So a bladder injury will feel like a UTI. A bullet wound would feel like UTI. Everything feels like UTI. She wouldn't listen to that. She's going, oh, I have an infection. So it's like, okay, prove it. Hi, Sue. Prove it. Now, I've had two next generation tests. The first test that I had was just to check it out. I wanted to learn the technology before I introduced it to you guys. So Microsen sent me a, Microgen sent me a, a test kit. They taught me how to collect urine. And in the end, it's a little tiny bit of urine, a tiny flask of urine gets sent back to them. They don't need a lot of urine to grow stuff out. They're just looking for DN, pieces of DNA to identify stuff. And within a couple of days, you get your PCR results. The PCR results are really just a quick screen of the 20 or 30 most common pathogens. That's, it will often be negative. That's okay. Because a couple of days after that, you'll get the next generation results, the full scan results. And that will tell you good bacteria. That will tell you bad bacteria. And that will tell you fungus. And it's, just, it's data. And I'm very data driven. I'm not interested in anybody guessing. I want facts. 
If I'm in pain, I want you to look at it and tell me if you see a problem. I want you to test it to see if testing identifies a problem. I am done guessing. We guessed for years with me that I had a bladder disease and all those treatments failed. Now I'm far more focused on causation. Here, I got to turn my heater off. It's cold here. Hence my... Hi, Deborah. Deborah from Louisiana. So um, I am and always will be a fan of next generation testing. There are some doctors who love it. They believe that they are saving lives with it for patients with a complex infection or a patients with lower urinary tract syndrome symptoms like I see or not responding to any therapy. What do our guidelines say? Stop what you're doing, take a step back and revisit the diagnosis. And one thing we want to look for is is there funky, funky, rare, difficult to, to diagnose infection, enterococcus, micrococcus, right? So I think the next generation test has an absolute place in the IC world. Um, and I support its use entirely. Uh, but there are some who don't like it. Um, they say it's too expensive. It's like $250 now. The price did go up during COVID. Uh, health insurance companies uh, may not pay for it. Medicare will pay for it. Um, and doctors often get very defensive because they don't know how to interpret the data. And when you don't know how to interpret the data, it's really easy to poo-poo it and say, ah, we're not going to do that. It's not good. You know, and when they just have, they just don't know. Um, at our IC class in May, AUA, Dr. Ann Ackerman gave that presentation on the urinary biome that we've talked about in the IC patient where they found this really rare, so so what is your urinary biome? These are the bacteria that are normally found that normally colonize the urinary tract. Urine is not sterile. There's important bacteria in there that do important jobs. So bacteria is not the enemy. Bacteria actually help, helps us do important things like make food for ourselves. So there's good bacteria and there's pathogenic bacteria. In all the early biome studies, um, what they found was IC patients had an apparently normal biome, although it was less diverse than people without IC, and there was an overabundance of lactobacillus. Well, Dr. Ann Ackerman at UCLA happens to be a biome master. She became very intrigued by this data. So she replicated the early IC study, well, early recent IC studies, and she made the same discovery, yes, Apparently normal biome, less diverse though, which is weird, and an overabundance of uh, lactobacillus, a supposedly good bacteria. And I would argue that if there's ever a group of patients who are going to have messed up biomes, it's going to be us because we have been so overexposed to antibiotics. I mean, I took massive antibiotics as a child for this quote unquote bladder disease that turned out to be a broken tailbone muscle dysfunction. But all those antibiotics take a toll on the biome. They just do. So um, she then um, looked at these the, the bacterial findings based upon subtype or phenotype. And this is what she found. Patients who are driven by pelvic floor dysfunction had completely normal biomes. Nothing to worry about. Patients who had pain beyond the bladder were dominant in E. coli. And patients, so like vaginal pain. And then patients who were bladder centric, pain on bladder fill, they were dominant in a specific species of lactobacillus called lactobacillus iners, I-N-E-R-S, lactobacillus iners. Now, again, lactobacillus are the good ones, the good guys, right? Not iners. They didn't even know iners existed until several years ago 
because it never cultured out in a urine culture. But then they added blood to a urine medium and ooh, look at this, this brand new bacteria grew out. Lactobacillus inus, what the hell is that? Well, it turns out it's pathogenic. Lactobacillus inus does not do what normal lactobacillus does. Uh, it doesn't kill fungus. Most lactobacillus kill fungus. And it actually damages tissue. It's like a pathogenic bacteria. It damages cells. So this finding is really quite revolutionary. And we're going to have to see. It's been six months she, since she presented that data to see what she ends up publishing. Because I think we can make a case for in our subtyping, you know, we've got that group of patients who do who might have chronic UTI, bacterial sensitivity. That's a small subtype, but it's absolutely possible. I believe that. Um, or for those estrogen atrophy patients, they're going to be more bladder centric too. I mean, infection centric too because they don't have that nice thick coating of mucus, which normally pushes the bacteria away from the skin. So I think that we can make a case for one, and perhaps a new subtype phenotype that's lactobacillus iners driven, that we could probably directly correlate with the improper use of antibiotics. So when this came out, I went in and did a lot of research and reading on it. Lactobacillus iners is not normally a dominant lactobacillus. Um, um, it is absolutely associated with poor long-term outcomes. In, in contrast, lactobacillus crispatus, which is a really good bacteria, that is associated with a very positive outcome. So, to have, so lactobacillus iners in quantity, not good. So the question then is, why does lactobacillus iners be, begin to dominate the urinary biome? And based upon my reading, um, it appears that it's just really, really fast growing after antibiotic use. Because when you take an antibiotic, you kill everything. You kill everything. And so what grows back? Um, are going to be those things which are quick to grow. And lactobacillus apparently is very quick to grow and it's very quick to consume all the resources and dominate the urinary biome. So hopefully we'll have more on that in the future, but that's, I think, going to provide direct support for a phenotype that's based on infection. It's just not going to be the infection people think it is. You know, there's a lot of people who say we all have E. coli, or, and that's just not the case. And it's going to be ironic if, it, if the INERS is really the causative factor for some patients, because everybody who told you to take long-term antibiotics just made it worse, in my opinion. Um, so Diane says, how, how will the lactobacillus INERS be treated? Well, that's the big question. Um, I think that what is going to be very important for all of us as, uh, in the coming years is getting a really good probiotics to make sure we are supporting a good, healthy urinary biome. Because the biome is really about good bacteria controlling bad bacteria, good bacteria controlling fungus. And so normally there's a good population of good bacteria to hold the bad bacteria back. But what happens is sometimes the bad bacteria get hold because the good bacteria have been damaged in some way. So, so that's one reason why making sure that you're, you're getting good probiotics every week is very, very important. We've got to repopulate the gut and your body with good beneficial bacteria, but it's very complex with INERS. There's still a lot of research. Florence says, I'm interested in microgen testing. Where can I get it? Go to bladderhealth.org. Bladder health, like good health, bladderhealth.org. You can watch videos over there. I'm going to be adding a bunch more videos 
We got some new patient case studies with next-gen testing. And there's an order button right there. You can just click on it and, and order it. Um, and if you're older and of a certain age, so we're dealing with estrogen atrophy too, there's a combination test that, that checks the vagina and uh, the bladder that would be very interesting. Where can I get it? Also, you're going to see your gyno for the first time tomorrow in a long time. Anything I need to ask her? I think I have pelvic floor issues. Well, I just I just think it's very important not to sabotage your appointment by mentioning IC first thing. Just don't do that. Once you do that, you fall down the rabbit hole of IC and however they believe. You got to walk in and discuss your symptoms. Hey, doc. So it's been a while since I've seen you. And these are the symptoms that I'm struggling with. I am having pain on the left side of my pelvis when I bend over, or I have sciatica, or I get this painful clitoris, or uh, I am urinating all night. You know, don't just say, I see. Not helpful. I need you to walk in and, and talk about your symptoms especially the rare and unusual symptoms, because the devil is in the details here. It's often that little random symptom that tell that confirms the diagnosis. Like, for example, if you have pain when you sit down, that gets better when you stand up. That's always neuromuscular. That's pudendal neuralgia. That means as you're going from sitting to standing or standing to sitting, body position is pushing on nerves and causing the pain. And when you stand up, you're no longer pushing on the nerve and the pain goes away. Yeah, bladderhealth.org. Uh, Diane says, is that the only way you can tell if you have a yeast infection? Yeah, it's the quickest way. Um, your doctor can do a specific culture, but it takes weeks to get the results back. Uh, Diane says, if my urologist poo-poos it, then how will I get treatment? Well, Microgen now has a list of doctors on, uh, by, by state, and you can they will tell you the nearby doctors who do Microgen testing. And then I think they even have doctors on, on hand. Um, and again, it's just data. That's all it is. It's useful information. Don't attach any emotionality to it at all. It's just going to tell us once and for all what's going on down there. And it's really ideal for somebody where you just, you are so freaking convinced you have an infection, you don't believe anybody. Prove it. Have an extra test. And it's fabulous. It's a fabulous way of looking at your urinary biome. And if it comes back normal, then it's not, you don't have infection. And that means we're going to be looking at something else like muscles or pelvic congestion syndrome or endometriosis on your bladder, whatever. You are an anatomical mystery to be solved. Uh, Diane said, is there enough in bladder builder I can't take for a day because of digestive issues? Um, you know, I think it's important to add a source of live cultures. Um, I do a coconut milk yogurt two or three times a week. Um, and um, some people do, what is that sour drink? Kefir. Ugh. I don't know how you can get kefir down, but some people like kefir. Um, fermented foods, things like that. The problem, of course, is sauerkraut, which is often suggested for its beneficial bio, uh, uh, beneficial probiotics, but I am not a sauerkraut girl. I just, it does nothing for me. Maybe once a year, I will have a teaspoon of sauerkraut. All right, hold on a sec. Sue says, I have tight pelvic floor muscles, Peggy, which make the bladder spasm, painful frequency, urgency, fullness. It helps with all these. I'm also food sensitive. It makes me less food sensitive, but I stick to my diet. Also, when my nerves are compressed by tight muscles, I get a different kind of pain that is also 
better, obviously not 100%, but I also do pelvic therapy, pelvic floor therapy, which helps a lot. Sue says, years ago, using long-term antibiotics and ended up with toxic drug poisoning, felt like I had the flu. Every time I took a dose until I could no longer tolerate it and ended up in the hospital, now it no longer takes, um, I guess, I, I think you're saying now I no longer take uh, macrodantin and things like that. You know, I took, oh, I took one, one Bactrim DS, one freaking pill, and it made my ears roar with tinnitus. It was like I had a semi truck idling inside my head for months. And I, now it's just a high pitched whine, but you know, that tells you that we really don't want to be indiscriminately popping antibiotics and other meds. You shouldn't be treating a flare with antibiotics. If you think you have an infection, get a dip, you know, go get the UTI test kit. That's one place to start. See what that shows. Then you can ask the doctor to do a urine culture, see what that shows. And if necessary, you can ask for a next gen test. But for God's sake, don't keep self-medicating with antibiotics every time you have a flare. I know it feels like an infection, but it's most of the time, it's really not infection. Danielle says, I finally got the chronic pelvic pain book. I'm so glad you got it, honey. It's going to help tremendously. Sue says, you need to try sauerkraut cooked by a Polish woman. It's the only way I'll eat Polish. You'll eat it. You have a Polish grandma. Sulfa drugs, yep. Um, we also get, I swear, I get every week somebody is in our shop and they say, well, which one should I pick? And I created all these shopping guides in the IC Network shop where I shared the common supplements that might be used uh, to, to just try to help you understand your options are. So for those of you with estrogen atrophy, bladder wall driven, it's really going to be, you want to try something with chondroitin, uh, a chondroitin based supplement because chondroitin is a building block of the bladder wall. So that's going to be bladder builder, bladder rest, cystoman, cystoprotect. Those are your top four supplements. Um, if instead you're a widespread pain patient, we have to focus on calming the nerves down. And that's what Peora does. P-E-A-O-R-A. -E that helps to calm nerves down. Many, many research studies support its use for many pain conditions. And if you're having a flare, a bladder wall flare because you went to grandma's house on Thanksgiving and you ate, you ate the lasagna because you couldn't break her heart and you forgot to bring your pre-leaf and you're flaring that night and the next morning. Okay, number one, dilute your urine, drink plenty of water. Number two, you can alkalinize your urine to try to counteract the acid. You can do that with pre-leaf or Tums. And that that's where aloe can be soothing. Um, uh, just like aloe is soothing to a burn on your skin, aloe can be soothing to an irritated bladder wall. Um, but not everybody can tolerate aloe. It can cause some gut-related side effects for some patients. But uh, we have aloe path in our shop, which I think is the best, in my opinion, aloe product on the market. I love that product because you got the soothing effect for the skin of the aloe combined with the nerve calming effect of the PEA. So that makes that a kick ass flare supplement in my opinion. But you know what? I, there's no way I can tell you what's going to work for you. It's going to be a bit of trial and error. Just know that we're very thankful now that we at least have some supplements that we can try. And they've been around for, some of them have been around for a very long time and have had large IC studies with them. Because we don't have an oral medication now that has a good bladder effect, bladder coating effect. Now that Elmeron is associated with eye disease and uh, bowel disease. 
All right. So hold on a sec. Sue says, it feels like you must be dying. So therefore you must have an infection or maybe cancer, but nope, none of the above. I just wish I knew that 35 years ago. Yeah, I know. Me too, honey. I was so convinced I had cancer that I was dying of cancer. I demanded exploratory surgery, which they did. And I woke up in the recovery room to a honey, we found nothing. It's not cancer. You've got IC. And of course, fast forward 30 years, well, 20, 23 years when I had my hysterectomy and they looked at my bladder again, they went, Jill, normal bladder. It's never been your bladder. It's always been your muscles and nerves. Kayleen said, I learned my lesson with antibiotics when endometriosis was all over my bladder. My uterus became so heavy that it hugged my bladder. I got nine UTIs in nine months. Holy moly, Kayleen. What do you think? The Why do you think that that happened? Were you on uh, estrogen re on birth control or Lupron to keep the endometriosis calm? Because that would have then thinned the coating on your bladder, which would have made your bladder more vulnerable to UTI. Nine UTIs in nine months, that's surprisingly not an unusual story, but it is when you're that young, because girl, you're young. Lee says, I'm a widespread pain patient, but I can't swallow pills due to my nerve and muscle issues. So it's a PR, the only option. No, you can actually buy powdered palmitoyl ethanolamide on Amazon and you can just sprinkle it in something. Um, let me spell it for you. Hold on. And I'm going to try to carry that in the IC network store. In fact, I have an order that I've got to place on Monday. Let me just make a note here. Oh, goodness gracious. Hold on. Check for PA. Lots of notes these days. Hey guys, give me a quick minute. I need to go use the restroom. So potty break. I'll see you back in a minute.
All right. I'm here. It was time for a reapplication of Tiger Balm. I don't know if, you, if, if for those of us who have pel pelvic floor dysfunction, for me, I always feel it in my left butt cheek, my glute. And when the muscle gets really, really tight, it starts to flutter, which it was doing this morning. And that's when I, I did a lot of Tiger Balm and it helps tremendously. Uh, the challenge with Tiger Balm is it smells like tropical Vicks Vapor Rub. I mean, like I like the smell now, um, but it's pretty strong. I mean, that'll clear your nose out big time. Uh, but anyway, Tiger Balm is good stuff for you, but you never put it in between your legs. It, it's not meant for mucous membranes. It goes on skin, dry skin on the outside. It would burn like heck if you accidentally got it on your vulva. Yikes. Yikes, that scares me. <laughs> You know, every now and then you use Vicks Vapor Rub, you know, especially in cold and flu season. And you don't get it all off and then you use the bathroom really quick. And all of a sudden you accident, accidentally got a little bit of Vicks Vapor Rub down there from the, from the toilet tissue on your and your hand. It's like, woo, that's not fun. Tingles. <laughs> Uh, okay, hold on. Denise, let's see, hold on. Denise said, I just got over a UTI, second one since March. I'm in vaginal atrophy and it was both times E. coli. I'm now using vaginal estradiol. How can I avoid these UTIs? Uh, you want to try something like, where is it? Where is it? Mm. My sample bottle is missing. It's called Prevent, P-R-V-N-T. And it's in the IC Network shop. It's a combination D Manos Proanthocyanidin product. It's a best selling product of that company by far. So it's called PR, it's like the word prevent, but with no E's. So P R V N T. Uh, check the ICN shop. And you'll see it right on the front. That would be, that would, it, it really, either that or Allura are going to be the supplements, but Allura is twice as expensive. So most people start with prevent first. Uh, May says the white or brown tiger bomb, very different, I think, in strength. Um, I don't do the red one. I do the white one because the red, the red really stains clothes. I've done the red one, but I like the white, I like the, the white one better, the clear one. Nancy says, will I ever be able to drink coffee again? Well, Nancy, it, it, what a fantastic question. So remember, number one, the bladder is always healing. Whatever has happened to it, your bladder right now is trying to heal whatever the heck is going on. Our job is to create an environment that will support healing. And so let's just say if we were to subtype you, you have Hunter's lesion. So let's just say if you have those bigger visible wounds on your bladder, you're not going to be drinking coffee for a long time. Because you, the last, if you had an open wound on your hand, would you pour coffee on it? Of course not. And what would happen to that wound if you poured coffee on it every single day? It would not heal. The wound would get bigger. It makes no sense to pour any type of coffee or green tea or black tea or soda on a visible wound. And Hunter's lesions are visible wounds that are very difficult to heal. Now we know why, because they appear to be viral infections in some patients. 
Now, let's just say your phenotype number two, bladder wall driven, estrogen atrophy. Okay, so let's say that as you've gotten older, you know, here's the thing. Think about your bladder for a moment. It's the only organ in the human body designed to hold toxic waste. You guys could probably repeat this verbatim. This is exactly what I say every single time. So how can the bladder hold ammonia and urea for hours at a time and not get damaged? It's really an evolutionary marvel. Well, it turns out that the way the bladder protects itself is really with a really thick coating of mucus. It's the mucosal barrier. So your bladder is like your mouth. It's a hollow organ that's wet on the inside. And that wetness, that mucus is a distinct physical barrier that protects urine from reaching the cells underneath and irritating those cells. The problem is, is that they're estrogen dependent. So when you're young and have lots of estrogen, girl, you got lots of mucus and you can have it probably get away with a lot of coffee. But if you're older and you have less estrogen or you're on Lupron for endometriosis or even on strong birth control, you're not going to have the estrogen, which means you're not going to have a nice thick coating of mucus. You're going to have a much uh, uh, thinner coating of mucus. And as you get older, sometimes the mucus kind of starts to go away for some people. I mean, I've worked with some women in their 80s who have never used topical estrogen, and their little vulvas are like dry potato chips, and they're in agony. Think about how dry mouth feels. It hurts. Listen, dry vulva, dry urethra, dry bladder hurts. So therapeutically, what I would say to you if you're in this group is, number one, we got to heal the skin. And the way we do that, the most natural way that we do that is with estrogen. So think about if you put a, a raisin in a glass of water, what does it do? It plumps up. Well, if you give the dry cells down there estrogen, they plump up. And so the, the ther therapeutic priority for somebody with estrogen atrophy is always going to be topical estrogen first. And you've now got to give your bladder time to heal. So I was working with a lady who was probably, oh, she was 52. And she was moaning and groaning on the phone. I love my diet soda. I love my coffee. I do not want to give them up. But she was in a really bad flare. And she, she, finally, pulled, she finally pulled back on them. And she's just now slowly starting to heal. But you have to understand the bladder is the slowest healing organ in the body. It takes two weeks for one cell to replace. So if you have just one coffee or one soda in that two-week period, you destroy an entire generation of cells trying to heal your bladder. You have to be off all of that for like at least three months, preferably six months, just to give your bladder time to heal. Now, will you ever be able to have coffee again? When that when that skin gets stronger, maybe, but we have a, something called the IC Network Coffee Challenge that will help us de help you determine if your bladder is ready for coffee. So number one, you always start first with water. Everybody's fine with water. Even if you don't like to drink water, for God's sake, drink water. Step number two is chamomile herbal tea or peppermint herbal tea. Chamomile and peppermint have gentle antispasmodic properties for smooth muscle of the bowel and the bladder. So having a strong cup of chamomile herbal tea when you're flaring or before you go to bed, spot on. Just get organic. You always want to get organic. If you do okay with that, your next step is going to be to try a brown rubos tea. And um, we have in the IC Network shop a Rubos pumpkin spice tea that I love. It's so good. And it's not pumpkin-y at all. It's more like caramel. So we want to try the brown grain uh, teas next, Rubos. If you do okay with the Rubos tea, your next step is going to be herbal coffee, dandy blend. You can have dandy blend right now. Let me go get the bag because I just... I just had a cup of it this morning. Hold on.
Okay. Dandy Blend is the bomb. Oh my God, this is so good. This is as close to coffee as you're gonna ever get. And it will not irritate your bladder. There's no acid in it. There's no caffeine in it. And yet, if you do, um, if if you relied on that cup of coffee in the morning to help stimulate a bowel movement, this will do the same thing because I use it for that purpose. Um, and so, Dandy Blend is, I think, absolutely the best herbal coffee on the market. It's not bitter. You can make lattes with it in the, in the winter. You can make frappuccinos with it in the summer. Um, I've been using this for years now. And I am in estrogen atrophy now. And this, I love it. Uh, I just love, love, love Dandy Blend. Okay. Then if you do okay with the herbal coffee, then you can try a real coffee. But it has to be a low acid coffee. And the, there are two low acid coffees that get the best reviews. Um, stay, stay, stay. Um, the, uh, Bella Rosa. This company... And in studies done at UC Davis, absolutely has the lowest levels of chlorogenic acid. This comes in regular half calf and decaf. So let's just say you're you're addicted to coffee. You've been you've done coffee for so long, a lot of it that if you stop coffee, you get headaches. What you can do is you can do the Bella Rosa half calf. And slowly titrate your titrate your caffeine level down over a period of a couple of one, a couple of months. You get to decaf, then we want to get you off the decaf because you still need the three to six months of not tweaking your bladder to give your bladder time to heal. So the Bella Rosa coffee is the bomb. Also Tyler's Tyler's no acid coffee. We're going to be doing a blast email for them. I hope this uh, this week or next week to get you ready for the holidays. But anytime anything hurts, you got to go right back down the step. Go go right back to the to the level underneath it. Generally, the herbal coffee, the rubose teas are fine, unless you have hunter's lesions. The patients with the hunter's lesions are going to be a, a little bit more sensitive. For the but for the great majority of us, fall in love with the dandy blend. You got to give it a try, Nancy. It's in the IC Network shop. Love, love, love it. Just go to icnetwork.org and just click on the store link and go into low acid coffees. Uh, Eddie says, hey, Eddie, how are you, dude? I ate, three, I ate a three musketeers candy bar two days ago and I'm flared up today. It seems like there's sometimes a delay by a day or two with my flares. I'm a fool for chocolate. Oh, you know, I got to tell you. Oh, listen, I have my own chocolate horror stories. Uh, when I was in my 20s, my family had a tradition of, at Thanksgiving, buying a two-pound box of C's candy. And from Thanksgiving to Christmas, we all got one piece of C's candy a night. I had no clue that I would become sensitive to C's candy. And by the end of my 20, you know, when I finally figured out that eating a piece of C's candy just killed my IBS. Holy moly, was that awful. And you know, the thing is, is I was for years in my 20s, I was so sick at the Christmas. I mean, it was, it was just so weird. I just felt so bad. I called them the my sick all over days. I just felt awful. And that was adult onset sensitivity. And I was sensitive to chocolate, oatmeal, and Christmas trees, pine. And the pine, the Christmas tree, the pine tree, oh, that was, once I got rid of the live Christmas tree and I got a fake tree, oh, I felt so much better. So those adult onset allergies and sensitivities that often hit in your 20s are powerful really rough. 
you know, and ultimately in the end, you, you guys, we all have to remember that our body changes with time and things that we might've been able to enjoy when we were younger, you might, you might not be able to enjoy as you get older. I mean, we've got wear and tear injuries. We've got uh, toxicities that build up over time. Let's say from somebody who drinks alcohol every day, that's going to affect their liver, et cetera, et cetera. And as we get older, ideally, we get smarter about the food that we eat. And hopefully we're eating better food, more fruits, more vegetables, more real meat, rather than the junk food that we lived on in our 20s and 30s. Uh, Diane said, how do you test for chocolate allergy or sensitivity? I did. Um, I can tell you exactly what I did. All right. So again, I had been sick for many years in my 20s, always over the holidays like four years in a row. It's just like, what the hell is wrong with Jill now? And between the bowel spasms and the headaches and all that sort of stuff, I was a mess. And then my sister gave me this old book called The Best Guide to Allergy. Uh, you can't even get this book now. This book single-handedly changed my life. And number one, it explained the difference between a food allergy versus a sensitivity. An allergy basically occurs, an allergy is more serious and you can, you know, kids who have nut allergies, their throat swells shut and they can die. I mean, food allergies can be very, very dangerous. A food sensitivity is not quite as dangerous, but it basically means that that food is a trigger in some way, like your, your body doesn't tolerate it well. Um, and, um, so what this book suggested was an elimination diet, but it was very, very specific. Uh, the first thing it said is lose the dairy, lose the dairy. And I had already been off of dairy. I had, I was definitely come to associate eating a lot of dairy products back then with kind of a lot more mucus and irritants down there. I can eat dairy now, but I never eat a lot of it. So I lost the dairy, but I didn't fix it. The second thing it told me to do was lose all the grains but rice. And 24 hours, I stopped all the other grains. My bowel, my bowel spasming stopped completely. So then it said, okay, reintroduce the grains one at a time. And as soon as I reintroduced oatmeal, the spasm started all over again. So that's how I figured out it was the oatmeal. And then there was another thing in here that talked about chocolate. And it said, okay, uh, what does he say here? Um, chocolate. Carob is a good substitute for chocolate. But again, remember that carob is a legume related to peas, beans, and soybeans. Anyway, once I lost the C's candy, the last of the cramping stopped over the holidays and I was fine again. Um, and then there was a little section in here on Christmas tree. Here, I opened it right to it. Christmas trees cause allergic symptoms to many people. The most common sources of difficulty are the airborne pollens and molds that are in the trees that remain there after they've been cut down and stored. A person who is sensitive to these pollens and molds will come into close contact with them when a large moist tree comes into the home. Then the heat of the house helps to release the inhalant substances into the closed indoor environment. Thus, a family recreates a specific pollen or mold season for a few weeks in December. Studies have indicated that a specific allergenic chemical called terpene is released by the tree itself. This substance directly causes allergy symptoms or nasal congestion and discharge and wheezing in sensitive individuals. People who switch to uh, artificial Christmas trees no longer have the problem and remain well during the holiday season. And I got to tell you, as soon as I read that section and I, I had just because my sister and I used to go get our Christmas trees. Um, I, I'd only had a Christmas tree in the house for like two days. And I went, ah, oh, darn it. I took the tree out in the, out in the backyard. And within a day, all my 
symptoms went away. And it's like, okay, we're going to go buy an artificial tree. She said, never, never, same, never been my bladder. But if you were to ask me even 10 years ago, they would find something that relieved my suffering. I wouldn't believe you. But I'm so thankful for subtyping now. I never thought there would be any cure or treatment that would work. Uh, and hold on one sec. Peggy says she just ordered allopath from us. Great. Kayleen said, I was on the birth control patch, but endometriosis loved beating the whole purpose of it. I had a painful period that lasted seven months. I think blood irritated everything. It does. Free flowing blood in the belly really hurts bad. Blood's supposed to be inside veins. It's not supposed to free flow through the belly. Uh, it did seem like my period started when I was bearing down from crying so hard once my grandma died. Yeah. And, and it's, a, you know, it's just amazing how the tears just randomly appear. Like I cried this morning while I was taking a shower. Just thinking about my, you know, oh, I'm not even going to go there because I'll start crying again. Okay. Uh, Florence said, I'm taking bladder builder and the alloy capsules together along with the multivitamin all from that shop. It, is it okay to do that? You know, Florence, my approach is less is more. Um, um, you know, companies have an incentive to want to sell you more. Because the more you use, the more you have to buy. Yet, when I was getting my pharmacology degree, they talked about a concept called lowest effective dose, what's the least amount of medication you can take and still get a beneficial effect. And because I am so freaking sensitive, um, that's what I do. I, I will start at a very low dose and, and I will slowly go up. So I start at one for a couple of days, see how I do. Then I might go to two, see how I do. Then I might go to three for several days, see how I do. I never get to four. I've never gotten to four with any of the supplements. Although I, I can take a full dose of pure and it's fine, which is just two. So I would be inclined to um, go slow. Or if you're already taking max dose, cut back by one or cut, cut back by one or cut back by two. And see if you get the same beneficial effect, because a lot of people can are fine with one or two a day. Nancy says it is inflamed. Personally, I think Farjija is the culprit. I cannot get a doctor to commit. OK, Kayleen says during bladder installations, when he lays down the sterile field, a draft of air hits my Volvo. Why is that? It does feel why it does feel like I'm dry. Um, see, I'm having psychosomatic congestion now from talking about that Christmas tree. Um, I think it could, I think it could be from <clears throat> air movement when he's sitting down. It's just the act of sitting down is displacing air. And because you're already up in the stirrups, it's just pushing it up against your skin, hun. Hi, Renee. How are you doing, hon? How is your Sunday? Eddie said, I heard once there's a correlation between people with IC and allergies. There is. There is. And Curtis Nickel, when he proposed his nine subtypes for IC, he was the first to say, yes, we believe there is an allergenic subtype, people whose symptoms are being driven in their bladder by some sort of allergy. Uh, we certainly do know that some patients flare during allergy season that is very, very well documented. 
And that is why when you look at the treatment guidelines for IC, they strongly suggest use of antihistamines, especially in patients who have seasonal allergies or a history of allergies. Uh, so Vistaril, Vistaril. And then for patients who have asthma, it's, um, what is it? It's in here. All right. I got this from a class on IC in 2018 taught by Robert Muldren, Robert Evans, and um, Jennifer Fiorello. All right. So hold on a sec. Excellent class on IC. So good. Let me see if I can find that. I'm zoning on the name of that. Oh, okay. Here, hold on. Um, antihistamine medications, hydroxyzine or cetirizine, inhibit mast cell release of histamines and can have a sedative effect. During allergy season, they suggested increasing the dose and or using Montelukast, Montelukast, especially in patients with a history of asthma. And then an H2 blocker, cimetidine, might also help patients with GI symptoms. So Monte Lucas for patients who have a history of allergies. Otherwise, it's going to be hydroxyzine. And it's true hydroxyzine can have a sedative effect. I took hydroxyzine for about 8 or 10 years. I love that stuff. I took a very low dose, uh, half of the lowest dose, actually. Um, one of the things that I like about hydroxyzine is it has a beneficial side effect of also being a bit of an anti-anxiety agent. So sometimes if you're going into the hospital for outpatient surgery, you're going in for a colonoscopy and they give you that little shot ahead of time, sometimes that's hydroxyzine and it just chills you out. Um, the, the challenge with hydroxyzine is, is that it can be a sedative. You, you don't normally take it during the day. It'll knock you, knock you on your tush. Uh, I usually took it around dinner time. I noticed that it was a little bit harder to wake up in the morning, like there was an extra level of sleep I had to break through to wake myself up. Uh, but once I was up, I was fine, and I didn't have any sedative effects during the day. Um, it made me a bit more heat intolerant. Um, I was able, listen, I was a professional tennis player. I thrived playing tennis when it was 100 degrees. 102, 103. Girl, my, my body loved that until I got onto hydroxyzine. And if it was over 90, I was really ill. It didn't feel good. So uh, hydroxyzine made me very heat intolerant. Um, but the final reason that led me to stop it is hydroxyzine can also affect your dreams. We call it hydroxyzine dreams. And so if you're having a good dream, it becomes the best ever dream. Like if you're having a sex dream, all of a sudden it's the best sex in your life dream. And if you're having a nightmare, it becomes an absolute night terror. It really intensifies dreaming. And finally, I started having night terrors. Like I, I had a dream uh, that I was watching my family have their throat slit. I like literally in the house that there was a stranger cutting their throats and it was just hydroxyzine dreams. And as soon as I stopped the medication, it completely went away. So hydroxyzine dreams are a very common side effect of Atarax or Vistaril. And remember, if a medication disrupts your quality of life, like if there's a medication that's making you very, very constipated or a medication that's giving you massive diarrhea, that might not be the medication for you. You know, we want to make sure that we're not, a medication is not interfering with your ability to function. Hi, Victoria.
Renee says, body won't take certain foods in older age. That's very true. I, especially from, although I got to say my parents love Taco Bell, even at 100 years old and 90. They just love crunchy tacos. Um, but uh, we ended up in the emergency room after Kentucky Fried Chicken. That never happened again. And um, my dad couldn't handle anything tomato based. It made him pee all night. And that's just because he had a hundred year old bladder. He didn't have IC. He just had a bladder that couldn't defend itself. Diane said, I had a two centimeter benign polyp removed from my uterus. Yeah, me too. Would that have caused bladder pain? Mm, not really. My guy didn't think it would make a difference because he said the polyp is squishy. I, I agree with him. I, I don't see that. I don't see that triggering bladder pain at all. I just don't. I had, I had a big polyp too. The only way I knew that there was a polyp was because I started spotting. It didn't affect my bladder at all. I mean, if you had, for example, a tilted uterus that was tilting over, over on top of your bladder, that would be a problem. Or if you had a bladder that was prolapsing and the top was bent over and pushing on your bladder. Uh, uh, well, no, if the bladder itself was bent over, that's a very, very painful. And what happens is, Urine gets stuck on this side and can't come out, and then you end up with bladder infection. Renee says the immune system in overdrive. I don't know. Kayla said last month we talked on the phone how my bladder looked fine during cystoscopy while well, I was doing well, and then I had a UTI that was so bad I had to have IV antibiotics. When I got out of the hospital two days later, I had terrible urethra pain, pressure, and feels like inflammation. It's so painful. Is this possibly a tight pelvic floor or inflammation that hasn't healed? I've been taking muscle relaxers and they are not helping. I'm so confused why my urethra is inflamed. So... Kayla, the very first thing that comes to mind, and, and you know, you're just clicking a bell of somebody I was just working with um, very, very recently who was in the hospital for exactly the same reason. You, know, you have to understand that there's a lot of drug-resistant pathogens out there causing bladder infections, and they become very, very difficult to treat. And so I guess concept number one is, do we know if the IV antibiotics killed it? Sometimes certain bacteria survive antibiotics. And so they would be doing multiple urine tests, both while you're in the hospital and afterwards, just to make sure that it has been tamed. And, and you're just an ideal person for a next generation DNA urine test, because that is much more effective at, at identifying bacteria and fungus than a typical urine culture because urine cultures are self-limiting. They will only grow out the bacteria that eat the food they provide in the culture medium. So cultures in general miss like 90%, 95% of the potential pathogens. So having a next generation DNA test and a PCR test would be, I would think, an absolute priority for you so that we can look at what they find, any drug resistance genes, and most importantly, fungal infection, because the second thing that comes to mind is, girl, you were on a lot of antibiotics in the hospital, and that creates the perfect environment for candida to grow, that it becomes a post-antibiotic fungal infection, because when you take the antibiotic, you're killing the good bacteria that normal, normally keep the yeast in check. And so once you lose this controlling bacteria, now we've got the perfect environment for fungus to, pro to prosper. So I would want to know too, do you, do you notice any correlation between eating sugar and eating a lot of carbs? And does that make the flare worse? If it does, that really points us to a fungal infection from the antibiotics. Um, and... Um, 
the urethra is kind of the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy and active infection. I can't tell from your picture how old you are. Um, the urethra can scream if your estrogen levels drop to a certain point. And the combination of estrogen atrophy on top of a really bad infection, I think that could create a big foundation. And then last but not least, honey, listen, you had a wicked infection that did a lot of damage. And that damage does not heal quickly. The bladder is the slowest healing organ in the body. So you have got to make sure that you are following the IC diet to a T right now. No coffee, no soda, no green tea, no black tea, no multivitamin. It's going to take several weeks for, the, for all those cells that were damaged by the infection to regenerate so that you have a correct and whole bladder lining. So if, you're, if you've been drinking coffee or soda since you've gotten home or cranberry juice or orange juice or tomato juice or anything like that, you could be having a diet-induced flare too. I think if I were in your shoes, I would call your doctor and say, hey, listen, I'm having a ton of pain and I'm not sure if the infection is back or not, or I'm not sure if I have a fungal infection now. Uh, I would like you to test my urine again, because if there's one thing we know is that E. coli is very, very good at escaping and escaping the effect of it, of antibiotics. Basically, E. coli changes shape and it goes from be kind of being like this to being a long, skinny ne a noodle. And when it's in noodle form, um, the white blood cells don't recognize it to kill it. So E. coli is quite good at surviving some antibiotics. It takes time to kill a freaking E. coli infection. So I would call your doctor sooner rather than later and just let them know you're really struggling. Uh, let's get another urine test or ideally a next generation DNA urine test. You might've already had that in the hospital. And let's just see if anything's growing in there. That would be my, my suggestion. Um, were you catheterized in the hospital? Did you have any procedures that might have traumatized your urethra? That's always possible too. Uh, Diane, Diane says, I have a uterus that that's tilted backwards and I have trouble with bowel moving and constipation. Yeah, you know, the pelvis is a small confined space and everything has a, everything has its position. And once things start moving out of position, bad things happen. Lee says, is there any help for endometriosis other than meds? I'm the queen of serious side effects and can't tolerate the meds. Um, Lee, I would encourage you to join the Endometriosis Association. They are a fabulous nonprofit, one of the best nonprofits in the country. Um, I did a big interview with their founder several years ago. One of the things that she taught me is that uh, endometriosis is now well known to be triggered by exposure to certain chemicals, dioxin among one, and they have the research to back it up. Uh, and they made that correlation back in the 80s that, um, you know, dioxin is the most toxic chemical made by man. It happens when you burn plastic. That's why you shouldn't be burning plastic in your, in any of your fires. Please don't. So what happens is it goes up the fireplace out into the environment, uh, where it settles in the grass and then the cows eat the grass. So now it's settled in the cow and the cow's milk. And then, you know, that cow's milk is used for ice cream and other products. And now we have a direct entry into the human body. And so one of the things that they strongly suggested back then is to remove all the toxic chemicals out of your home. And I actually have a blog on that. That's something that I do anyway. Uh, I've been doing for years because my sense of smell is so crazy. Um, let me see if I can get the title for that. Um, it's a blog over on the IC network. Uh, or it might be a page. Uh, 
Uh, it's called Reducing Toxic Chemicals in Your House. And it's the last link. No, it's not quite the last link under self-help uh, on our website. And I really support this because we're getting a lot of crap from China, toxins that have never been tested. I mean, China is so reckless in their manufacturing, so reckless. So, you know, listen, take my word for it. If somebody at Christmas gives you a cheap little candle set that they got at Joanne's, put it in the garage. Don't even bring it in your house. As soon as you get a strong smell from it, just put it in the garage. Um, and I remember, I forget the statistic. It's like, there are 250 new toxic chemicals introduced through manufacturing into the U.S. environment like every month. or And so we really have to protect ourselves. Diane said, I'm doing weekly installations to coat my bladder for six weeks. I have estrogen atrophy and I've been using vaginal estrogen for a year and it's helped some. Good. Excellent. Keep it up. Keep it up. And when you're ready to be off of the installations, that's where going back to one of the conjoint supplements can give you maybe a little bit of extra protection over time. Um, hold on a sec. Sue says, I'm surprised your dad could eat Taco Bell. Oh, they love crispy tacos from Taco Bell. But he also had terrible acid reflux from a hernia. So it probably wasn't good for him. Kayleen said, can we chat either tonight or tomorrow so I can find a doctor that will treat my clitoral adhesion? Tomorrow, huh? Not tonight because my throat's getting real sore from talking too much. And I've been up since four in the morning, so I'm not going to be... I have to go lay down after we're done and try to rest. All right. Somebody on Facebook is pointing something about HIV, honey. We're not an HIV group. I'm going to uh, ban you from my page. You are not welcome here. Uh, Kayla says, I'm 34, so I don't think it's estrogen. I've been following the IC diet. My urine it was retested twice. It showed no more infection. I'm not sure how to go about DNA testing, but we'll look into it. Kayla, I built a website on it, bladderhealth.org, bladderhealth.org. Whoops, here, hold on, I'll give you a link. Ah. I got cables everywhere. Okay, hold on, bladderhealth.org. Go over there. You can see some videos from doctors who use it. And there are a ton more case studies and videos over on the Microgen website. I Listen, it's just data. It's just data. And what you'll see when you, when you go through their case studies and stuff is it's really ideal for somebody who has had a history of UTI. Their cultures are coming back negative. Most importantly, they're still very symptomatic. That's when we have to go, hmm, do we have a more difficult to uh, diagnose infection going on? And that's why the next generation test, I think, would be really appropriate for you, given where you are right now. Sue says, I was working in, uh, working a plastic injection molding machine in 1982 when I was stricken with severe IBS after three months of that, which is when I thought I got a bladder infection, which never went away, was not the bladder infection, was a trigger to my pelvic floor. I do believe it, I, it, I was predisposed to it from pelvic floor injuries and central sensitization. I mean, so the exposure to the chemical certainly didn't help your body. But I, I do think that your triggering event was falling from that horse that one time. Uh, Sue says the factory was shut down by OSHA because of high fumes two weeks after I quit work. Uh, and you could not leave the house because of severe IBS. You also had bad menstrual cramps. Well, and dioxin is an estrogen mimicker, and that could explain the painful menstrual cramps. Um, not sure about the IBS, but I think it's possible.
I think it's possible. Um, Diane says, and you guys remember, if I'm looking straight, I'm looking at Facebook. If I'm looking over to my left, I'm looking at YouTube. So I'm always going back and forth. Um, let's see. Diane said, if the installations don't improve my pain and frequency, we'll do a Botox. Well, again, Diane, the cent center central here is being phenotyped correctly. You know, I mean, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. And we got to rule stuff out. We have to rule out infection. We've got to rule out uh, tight pelvic floor muscles. We got to rule out the fact that your uterus is tilted. Um, there's just stuff that has to be checked. And so, you know, if there's one thing we've learned over the years in the IC movement is that bladder treatments don't work for the great majority of patients over time. Why? Well, because for most of us, it's really not a bladder problem. It's a, it's a nerve or a muscle problem. And I'm the perfect example of that. So the thing is, is if you're not responding to bladder therapies and you're getting worse rather than better, that's our motivation for stopping, taking a step back and revisiting the diagnosis, asking what could we have missed? Did we miss anything like tight pelvic floor muscles, pudendal neuralgia, or a rare infection or whatever? Uh, Diane says, Botox in shots in the bladder to help pain and frequency from the estrogen atrophy. Well, Botox acts by silencing nerves. It doesn't fix anything. It just silences the nerves for a brief period of time. So it's going to help you, help you in the short term, but not in the long term. We still have to be laser focused on underlying cause. It's very important that we try to figure out underlying causation. Diane says, and my euro says, I have overactive bladder, so the Botox shots in the bladder will help this. It could. Just remember that there is a risk to Botox. The risk is it can cause urinary retention. You know, when they, when they do Botox, they just basically randomly put Botox in the bladder wall. They have certain locations that they do, but, you know, it's kind of like here and here and here and here and here. Well, if they accidentally silence the nerve that controls your ability to empty your bladder, you're going to need to catheterize for a while until the Botox wears off. So Botox, a Botox therapy is not without risks. And, 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 and the new AUA, okay, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I got to look at something here. Um, Curtis Nickel talked about that in his phenotyping proposal last winter. Let me find that. So remember, we have been using um, Chris Payne's five-point system. Oh, I learned something interesting. I had a nice chat with Dr. Payne this week. Um, uh, and so we've been using that very, very successfully for the last six, seven years. The, he believes that there are five distinct groups. But then Dr. Curtis Nickel, who's also one of the top ICU researchers, trumped him and said, well, I think there's nine groups. And he also published his recipes for treatment. And he said something very specific about Botox. So hold on a sec. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, he used Botox for patients uh, uh, what, that he defined as primary storage syndrome, symptom syndrome. Some IC patients run to the restroom to reduce pain. Their frequency and urgency is driven by avoiding pain caused by the bladder filling. Dr. Nickel believes that these patients can benefit from an anti-muscarinic medication like solafenacin if the pain has first been controlled. Mirabigron helps patients with both urgency, frequency, and pain. He believes that bat bladder training is essential to increase bladder capacity. And Diane, this is what he said. As a last resort, Botox can provide short-term symptom relief 
though it carries a risk of urinary retention. Um, and let me give you this link so that you can read that yourself. Um, Diane said, and she said, it's very rare to have urinary retention. She's had one patient since she started doing Botox in the bladder for seven years. Well, it was very common uh, before that. Because in our old AUA guidelines, the dose was doubled. And then somebody did research that proved that if you reduce the dose by half, the risk of urinary retention reduced. But back in the old days, before seven years ago, ur urinary retention was very common. And I still get calls from patients who get urinary retention for Botox. Not as many, but it still happens. Um, Sue said there's, there's documented evidence of plastics causing IBS in research. I didn't know that. I have to look at that. Kayleen says after work from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. CST, that would be better so that it will be during business hours. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to change up my phone system, guy. That's what woke me. I woke up at four o'clock this morning, actually like 345, thinking about my phones. I mean, I'd already slept for seven hours because I went to bed early last night, but um, I just, I, it wasn't a nightmare. I was just thinking, oh my God, I can't pay $100 a line. I have three landlines here in this office. And now they're trying to force us all over to voice over internet. So they tripled the price. So each landline's $100 now instead of 20. So I'm going to have to get rid of these landlines here. And I think what I'm going to do is just put them onto a cell, put my main line at 9442 on a cell phone. That way I can carry it with me. Oh, my head was spinning this morning trying to solve this technology problem. Uh, Diane says, I do have bladder pain when my bladder is full. So I do run to the bathroom sometimes to prevent a full bladder with horrible pain. So Diane, when they looked in your bladder, did they see Hunter's lesions? I'd say one advantage of having Botox is they have to really look at your bladder closely. I mean, I mean, you're definitely that severe pain on bladder fill is pointing to your bladder. All right, hold on a sec. Sue says, my Botox is done in my pelvic floor muscles, not my bladder wall. It is to relax those muscles caused because I have been guarding with them for 40 years. You know, Sue, what's so freaking crazy is I belong to Kaiser and Kaiser won't do any muscle work like that. They'll do physical therapy, but they will not do Botox. They will not do trigger point injections. They will do nothing. I have to pay out of pocket to have that done. Sue says, I've never had a problem going after my Botox injections, like, but like I said, they're my muscles. Uh, Florence says, how does a tilted uterus affect your bladder? I'm confused. I was told by a gyno years ago in the twenties that I had a tilted uterus. Well, it de I think a lot of it depends on where the tilt is. Um, you have to understand that there's a lot of things that attach to your uterus, like ligaments, your fornix ligaments and blood vessels and nerves and things like that. And so if your uterus is tilting backwards, you're stretching stuff abnormality. You might be putting pressure on nerves. And the weight of the uterus could land on your bowel and cause issues with your bowel potentially. Diane said, no lesions, just severe inflammation with lamurulations and petechial hemorrhages. So lots of blood. So the finding of petechial hemorrhages and glomerulations has been thrown out as being meaningful in any way to IC. Our latest guidelines say that, that basically that's a byproduct of having a hydrodistension. Um, I'm very curious about your inflammation, though. 
Um, the inflammation implies that, that, that there's basically biological warfare happening um, in, in your bladder wall. Um, I would want, I think I would want to probe a little bit about unusual infection. I see if there's anything funky going on in there. And not only bacterial, but black, but fungal and even viral. We now have a direct correlation between the Epstein-Barr virus and the polyomavirus infecting the bladder wall and causing severe inflammation. So, and COVID can too. So have you had COVID? Did this all begin after you had COVID, Diane? Man, it is cold here. I'm cold. My thermostat is at 65 and I'm cold. Turn on my little heater. Deep breath in, deep breath out. Let's do it again. Deep breath in, and a deep breath out. A lot of centering happen. Let's do a couple of affirmations. You had it before COVID, but it got worse after a while after COVID. That's what our research shows, is that for about 75% of IC patients who get COVID report flare, more severe flares. And for about 25% of them, they're very, very severe flares. That's part of that cytokine storm with COVID. Um, and so uh, it comes as no surprise that you flared. And that's why, you know, guys, listen, I mean, we're entering the holidays again. And, you know, for years, I miss, we missed out on all of our family celebrations during COVID because I, I didn't dare want to bring COVID into my elderly parents' home because I knew it would kill them. And actually, my mother died with COVID. Um, we all got COVID at the hospital when my dad collapsed. Um, I would firmly ask family members who are sick not to come. Or if you're sick, stay home or try to have it outside. If it's warm enough, you know, try to be outside as much as possible. Uh, Diane said, does next generation testing diagnose viral infections? Yeah, that's all the COVID testing is next gen testing. But that typical microgen test, urine test does not test for virus. They have other tests that will do that. Sue says, you've been up since four, you're probably tired and it will make you cold. Yep. I believe it. All right, guys. Well, listen, you got any other questions for me? Um, so uh, what's happening this week? I'm going to try to post uh, a holiday blog every day this week. I haven't decided if we're going to do a Black Friday sale in the IC Network store because everything is already, guys, everything is already so heavily discounted that uh, I, I Anyway, I, I haven't given thought. If we do it, it'll be free shipping because we're already just barely above wholesale anyway for a lot of these products. I mean, because I really try to keep them very, very low for you. Um, uh, not sure what's going to be happening next Sunday, holiday weekend. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um and then um, let me just look at the month of December really quickly.
I really have videos. I got to get out like mad. All right. So Thanksgiving, the Sunday after Thanksgiving is the 25th. Then we got December 2nd. That should be fine. December 9th, that should be fine. December 16th, that should be fine. December 23rd. Hmm. That So the day before Christmas Eve. No, Christmas Eve is the 24th. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a second. It's the 3rd, 10th, 17th, 24th. So we will not be doing a meeting on Christmas Eve, undoubtedly. Uh, nor on New Year's Eve. There's going to be a two-week break from meeting. Uh, Lama said, I had urinary retention. I feel, I, I feel pain when my bladder is full. And when I go to pee, it's very difficult to pee and pain too much in the left side of the vaginal area. Okay, honey. So anytime we've got urinary retention like that, the very first thing we look at is tight pelvic floor muscles. And the fact that you have pain on the left side as compared to the center, that points us directly to your pelvic floor muscles. So have you had a proper pelvic floor muscle assessment? And, you know, the question we ask to determine that is uh, when you go to pee, can you start your stream right away or do you hesitate 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds before you can relax? Emphasis on the word relax enough to release urine. Tight muscles are hard to relax. So I would definitely want you to have your muscles checked just to be on the safe side. You know, you guys, I moved the light and I see now I got the shadow coming off of my eye like that. Hmm. We'll have to, or is it off this eye? Oh no, it's off of this eye. It's the light hitting my glasses. Oh, let's see if it goes away. Yep, it went away. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to you, Boria. Sue says, I hope you get some time with your family. I was with my family yesterday, my sister's birthday. So I'm, plan I'm planning on it. I hope so. It's just, it's going to be, I'm just letting the holidays just kind of ebb and flow. Because the emotions are ebbing and flowing and ebbing and flowing with grief, right? I realize, oh, no, I can't talk about it because I'll start crying. Oh, okay, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't need to cry now. I already cried this morning for about 30 minutes. I just happened. That's grief. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, I'm going to let you go. I will see you possibly next weekend. If you find these meetings helpful, please come on over to the IT Network and sign up for our free newsletter. Or better yet, make a donation or buy something in our store or become a member so that you can get our fabulous patient magazines. And depending upon the membership you get, you get a lot of past magazines too. And these magazines are kick-ass good. So please support us by becoming a member. That would be fantastic. All right, I'm going to say goodbye to Facebook. I will see you guys later. All right, Facebook is down. All right, YouTube, I will see you guys later too. Be well. Happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy those precious moments with your seniors because once they're gone, it's really a blow. All right, guys, I'll see you later. <laughs>